Correct. Fantastic. Well, did you find the last staff session helpful? As, as um, tedious as policies and procedures are, I have to tell myself this is a gift from God to help me and highlight any anywhere I might be going too close to the the line. You know, it's a great encouragement to just work on that to get me back to center. You know, making sure that our doctrine is straight, making sure that our lives are doing well, making sure. And at the end of that, we can hear those beautiful words: "Well done, good and faithful servant." Because it's absolutely heartbreaking when you read God's generals, uh, like I shared with you a few weeks ago, and just see that all these people who could have gone on to impact more of the world, who have gone on and, you know, ended with such a, a wonderful uh, reputation. Because right now people are taking books off Ravi Zacharias, books off the shelves, they're taking curriculums off, they're, they're deleting Carl Lentz's uh, sermons, because... It's like everything that you worked for and is no longer, because it's always like, was he dodgy at that time in the background? We don't know. Where else, if you can actually finish well, it's really, really powerful. Okay, speaking of finishing well, guess what? This is the last two hours or one and a half hours of uh, intro to leadership. Boo. Okay. Boo or boo? Boo. Boo. <laughs> oh, that's good. I'm glad. I'm glad you feel that way. Uh, and so I'm hoping that you are doing well in your studies, that you're not falling back, that you're doing all that you need to do. Please ask for help early. So, so important. Uh, give me five out of five if you are on track with your studies in regards to assignments for this unit. Three out of five if after today, you're going to really work hard. One out of five if you are really struggling. Show me your fingers. Go. Four, three, five, just one, three. Personal interest. Personal interest. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, have you spoken to Derek? Okay, so are you waiting on him or are you just unable to do the work or what's happening? Just, just usually, uh, maybe online, so the Moodle? It's very, it's not very easy to navigate, is it? It's very difficult. It's the only, it's the big negative. It's the big negative with working with this particular organization, but it's actually the best organization that we have access to here in Australia. Gloria, you got put five, if I'm correct. So if you get a chance, can, can you just see if there's something you can do to help? Is that okay? Thank you so much for that. Okay, today we wanna to talk about authority, all right? And then in the last session, you all must ask one question. You must ask me one leadership question. This is between passing and failing the unit from my perspective. You must ask me a good question. All right, that's in the second session. The first session, I wanna to talk to you about authority, which is the mark of a Christian leader. Uh, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Romans chapter 13, one verse five. This must be the foundation whenever we are studying authority. Romans chapter 13, one verse five says this. Let everyone, everyone, everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against God. All right. Um, uh, against a, it's a rem what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. 
for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Can you see something repeated a lot in that passage? Okay, it should be authority comes from God. Authority is established by God. If you rebel against authority, you are rebelling against God. If you submit to authority, you are submitting to God. If you do right, God will commend you. God will bless you. So how you treat authority is how you treat God. There's a, there's a connection here, okay? You cannot say, I love God, I respect God, I trust in the Lord and don't trust authority. Why? Because he's the one that established authority. This is counter-cultural. This is not what the world teaches right now. But this is who we are we are countercultural people and we need to understand that even if the authority is ungodly i didn't vote for them i don't like their policies i don't like what they're saying i don't like what they're wearing i don't like their background right you don't have to vote for them but you must when they come in respect them honor them that's who we are for some reason, I don't know the reasons, God decided that ScoMo would be the Prime Minister and that Mark McGowan would be our Premier. For some reason. Okay? With all their flaws, with all their differences, that's who God's put. Therefore, out of honour for the Lord, I'm going to honour these people. Okay? So that's really important. Christian leaders understand how authority works. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 5 to 10, we have this really interesting story of a centurion. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and asked for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home, paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just Say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go and he goes and that one come and he comes. I say to my servant, do this and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Okay. Jesus says, all right, would you like me to come and heal your child? He goes, no, no, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. But you don't even need to come. You see, I've got authority. I tell this one go, they go, I tell that one come, and they come. Because why? Because I'm a man under authority. Because because I'm a man under authority, I've got authority to tell my servant to go, and they have to do it. He goes, Lord, you don't even have to come to my house. I know you are a man under authority. You are under God's authority. And because you are under authority, you have authority. If you are under authority, you have authority. Once again, this is counter-cultural. In the world, they want authority without accountability. They want authority without somebody telling them what they can and can't do. That sort of authority leads to breakdown. That sort of authority leads to people not ending well. All right? People say, how did Ravi Zacharias do what Ravi Zacharias did? Because Ravi Zacharias did not come under anyone's authority. He had no board. He had a board. But he was the leader of that board. That board couldn't question him, couldn't ask him anything, couldn't tell him no. So therefore, when you're not under authority, you 
have no real authority, it doesn't last. But now that I'm under authority, I have authority. What's my authority? My authority is that I'm under Pastor Wayne Alcorn. He's the ACC national president. So if someone says, you, how dare you tell the state what to do? I say, hey, listen, I can only tell the state what to do because I'm under the national and the national told me I can tell the state that they need to do this, right? So if you're under authority, you have authority. But if you keep working hard to get yourself out from under authority, having nobody accountable, having nobody asking you the tough questions, having nobody speak into your life, you're dangerous and you're losing authority. So here's my question to you. Who gets to say no to you? Who have you invited to say, no, you're not doing that? Why? Who do you have that questions your motives, that you've asked them to question your motives? Who have you brought into a place as an advisor who can actually speak into your marriage? Or is there certain areas that are just no-go zone? You can't tell me to talk about my marriage, you can't talk about my children, you, can't, you can only talk about this area of my life and give me guidance here. We actually need to make sure that we are under authority, we have accountability in every area. Can I tell you the higher you go up in leadership, the more people say, oh, well, he's the senior pastor. Just do whatever. The more success you have, the more authority and promotion you have, people just go, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I've had to do? I've had to make authority to come under. So now that I'm a senior pastor, my senior pastor says, hey, Joel, we're now friends. I'm not the senior pastor. We're now friends. I said, no, David. I go, I know that's how it works, but I'm telling you, you're my senior pastor. I want you to challenge me about the way I lead. I want you to challenge me about the way I live my life, my kids, my marriage. I give you permission to ask me the tough questions. I need a senior pastor. You know, Pastor Peter in the structure is under my covering, but I've made Pastor Peter an accountability. Pete, I want you to tell me when you see me going too extreme with this political stuff, I want you to tell me when you think my sermons are not in line with the word of God. I want you to tell me when I'm dropping the ball in some areas and I want you to come and do what you did at staff today, which is protect me by actually going, oh, there's one part that you've missed out here. He didn't make me feel bad or make me look bad. He just protected me, right? You've got to invite authority to do that. People go, oh, you're so lucky, Pastor Joel, that you've got people like Pastor David Storer being a spiritual father to you. And I said, it's not luck. You know why you don't have a spiritual father? Because you don't want to be a spiritual son or a spiritual daughter. You're wanting to be a rebellious, do your own thing. You haven't invited them. You don't listen to them so they don't speak. But the reason these guys who are great leaders take time to speak into my life is because if they say, can I talk to you? I cancel everything. I'll go over to their office. I'll get them a coffee and go, what? Tell me. Oh, no, nothing. No, don't you hold anything back from me. I'm here. <laughs> Shape me, mold me. I need you. I can't see my blind spots. You are my authority. And as long as I come under your authority, I have authority, right? And to make boundaries, put people, invite them in. Be honest with them, because otherwise, it's a dangerous world out there, okay? So, along with that whole understanding of authority is the question, who are your current authorities? So right now on a piece of paper, on a laptop, whatever, while I quickly eat another mouthful of my lunch, would you write down some of the authorities you currently have? Now, I'm not talking about God. I'm not talking about the police. Oh. I'm not talking about. Uh, I want you to. I want to know who who you closely have authorities in your life. Give me one minute to do that. Yes. Names. Names. I want your names. I want names. If you don't know their names, they're probably not your author direct authority. You don't have a relationship with them.
So list out the names down a page if possible rather than across. One after the other. Would you count for me to connect? Next question. How well are you respecting and serving those authorities? How well are you respecting and serving those authorities? If you say 10 out of 10, what are you doing to serve them, respect them? If you say one out of 10, what are you doing to serve them and respect them? Because it's not, in, it's not enough that they're in your life. It's how you respond to them. How do you speak about them behind their back? How do you speak about them when they make mistakes? Do you roll your eyes when they're giving you advice? How have you blessed them? Have you opened your heart to them? Does this make sense? You're all really quiet, so I don't know if this is like too heavy or you're all good. Good? Because I'm hoping you might go, okay, I'm good with that one and that one. Do you know what? This one here, I need to invest into that, that authority. I need to pray for them. I need to send them a card. I need to give them a phone call, ask them some questions of me i.e., hey, how do you think I'm going? You know, what I'm trying to get you guys to do is develop a hedge of protection with people. That's what I'm trying to do. In this last leadership session, if you go out here with just the leadership skills and the communicating vision and strategic planning, great, but it doesn't mean that you're going to last. But if you can build a hedge of protection, then you might actually last. Here's another question. Who do you need to appoint as a new authority in your life? Who do you need to ask? Who do you need to make room for to be a new authority in your life? Because as I said to you, you might not have many and you might need to get a peter hammer and raise him to that place as a molder and a shaper of your life does that make sense good okay are we ready to move on everyone's still alive good here's the next question i have here this one i want you guys to answer out loud how, no, uh, what happens if the authority is ungodly, unkind, or old fashioned? What, what happens if your current authority is ungodly, or unkind, or old fashioned in their thinking? Basically, that you have a disagreement with them. What do you do? Talk it out? Okay. Just come to the agree. Sometimes I get to agree to disagree at some point and go over it, try and see where they're coming from. But their heart, because not necessarily your mind space where you are, it's going to be a safe spot where they are from experience and life. So agree to disagree. Is that submitting to an authority? No. 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 Right? So I think we need to break that up. Purposely put three things in one big group. <laughs> ungodly, unkind, or old fashioned, or a different style to you. I purposely put three things there. Why? Because there's three different responses. 
okay? Old fashioned. Guys, I want tablecloths here. I want tablecloths, and I want curtains closed properly. That's what I want. I'm like, oh, so old fashioned. Come on, what's wrong with tablecloths, right? Pastor Joel, I agree to disagree with you. No, no. In those cases, what do you do? Submit. Submit to authority. You may not like it, you don't like the style, you don't like the personality, you don't like... Okay, guys, I want black tablecloths, not green tablecloths. But I like green, green's my favorite color. Everyone thinks green is good. No? Okay, I've, I've, I've shared with you, like, I love green. I think green's good for this way, and you're still staying black. Black it is. Submit to authority. Personality and style don't come into authority. Okay? That is style. You submit to leaders with different styles because you have placed them in that place of honor to speak into your life. Doesn't mean you can't communicate. You can communicate your heart. This is not you just not being, you know, just being told what to do. Communicate your heart. But at the end of it, so Peter and I, from time to time, we have some, you know, I think this, I think this, I think this, I think this. In the end, he goes, okay, I've already shared with you everything. Now, if you still don't think it, we'll just go with you. And he'll keep a sweetheart, you know? Other times when he shares with me, I'm like, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't know that, really? Wow, okay, let's change. But us, there are some times where, no, we're not changing. We're gonna hold the course. But because it is a style thing, he submits to that. What about an unkind or, you know, uh, harsh thing, but still not ungodly? Like maybe what I shared today at the <laughs> staff meeting. Don't hug extensively. Guys, don't put your arms around the girls and hold them there. It's a, oh, that's a bit unkind. You could have said it in a nicer way, right? Come on, BJ. You know, these are volunteers. They're Bible college students. You freaked them out, right? So you can actually share that. How you do it's really important. Yeah. Privately. Yeah. Sure. By what you were saying about the uh, young girl you. Yes. Yeah. We would never say from the pulpit, you know, if you're wearing a see through bike pants, don't blah, 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 blah. that's not right. But you, you, go and sort this out. They take her aside, talk to her. She was walking around with her uh, jumper wrapped around her. She won't be wearing skin colored bike pants to youth group and she's a beautiful girl right she's she's not a child she's she's a woman and just was not appropriate but she obviously hasn't got maybe parents speaking to her in that way or the world says it's okay but she's now in the house of god we've got to help her grow in her discipleship we've got people that come along so love her kindly do it right but if a leader isn't being unkind doesn't mean that they're wrong they're just doing it in probably not the best way and so how you do it is actually say, hey, there's a better way. Can I suggest a better way? Pastor Taryn does this for me all the time. PJ, I love what you're saying, but to reach the millennials, you're going to have to communicate the message differently, right? So I used to say, and in, you know, in my age group, it was like, dressed like a bunch of tarts, right? Ooh. Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so, all right, we've got nods here going, yeah, amen. I know what you're talking about. And then we've got, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's bad, you know? Sorry? That, well, you see, see, our generation, that's what it is. That's not right. Yeah, but you look like a tart. Come on, love, you're so much better than that. So, right? This generation, that's uh, slut shaming, is it? I mean, yeah. the fact that you call it <laughs> slut shaming, that's for me even worse. The fact that, yes. okay, so you're saying don't slam a, sh a slut. So <laughs> that's a problem to me because, like, let's help her not be a slut rather than shame, you know what I mean? But <laughs> Gloria and Cosmo, this is that generation going, <laughs> they're going, PJ, <laughs> we all agree, right? Let me see if I got this right with you, you younger guys. You're all going, we agree, we yeah. agree, but let's not use yeah. those words. Yeah, sure. Right? The, those words mean something completely different right now. <laughs> okay? 
Is that swearing? That's not, it is. Okay. Okay. So, so all I'm saying is. Depends on my generation. That's right. That's right. Depends on which generation. So, you know, so the other one is this like, you know, in, when you, I'm speaking at chapel, Pastor Taryn's speaking at chapel, which is not me, she was speaking. And she goes, you know, sometimes when you just stuff up, right? And she did it in the chapel service. Now, our generation, you just stuffed up, right? Chapel generation, it's like you just beat up. Yeah, stuffed is a really bad word. Okay, so what am I trying to say? It comes across as unkind. Okay, so we actually need, the because we're a multi-generational church, so I needed to sit with Taryn and go, Taryn, that was a great word. At 10 o'clock, the word stuffed up is not acceptable. What, really? Yeah. Just, yeah, absolutely, didn't use it second time. Same with me, you're a bunch of tarts, no more. There's no tarts, the only tarts is the Christmas tarts that we eat at Christmas time, right? That's no longer acceptable, why? Because a person from another generation actually helped me to articulate that message, okay? And so when it's, otherwise it came, comes across as unkind, you know? And so actually having some good people around you help you. So how do you do that? If you bring the person aside private and say, hey, can I just share something? I love the heart. I love the truth of that message. I love the honesty of that message. Can I suggest if you just change this word to say the same thing, but say this word instead of that, they will hear your heart better. Wow, what a gift. What a gift, right? What a gift to actually have people like that that are looking after you, wanting you to get your word beyond, even further beyond. So a wise person would not be insecure and react badly. They will take that on, okay? But what about if the, the authority is ungodly? That deserves a different type of reaction. Okay, what's the ungodly? What do we do when someone's asking to do something ungodly check with a godly person yeah yeah so obviously if it's contradiction to the word you can't do it why because even though all authority has been established by god you're submitting to this authority because of the authority above him the highest authority is your relationship with god so in the case of uh exodus when the two midwives, Shifra and somebody else, was told by Pharaoh to go and kill all the boys born in Israel, they feared the Lord, the Bible says, right? So they disobeyed their authority and feared for their own lives, really, but they were willing to disobey their authority to serve their highest authority. Does that make sense? It's so really, really important that we understand don't like it too bad you can have conversations but you know what i don't like it but i'm going to do it unkind let me help you without being arrogant this would be awesome if you could just change this this and this ungodly i respectfully say no right so in victoria pastors are being told they cannot counsel anyone struggling with sexuality as of now, they've been trained as of today, last week, in fact, they had lawyers come and sit in churches. You cannot, the, a pastor friend of mine has a couple that's been going there for many, many years serving. They said, my son is thinking of becoming a daughter. He's in the church, he's in the youth group. Can you please send the youth pastor somebody? No, we cannot help you. Our lawyers have told us that we can pray for you from here. We can't lay hand, pray for him, anything like that, because that will be seen as us suppressing a that's difficult, right? For me, in those circumstances, I don't know because it's not law here yet, but I, I, would, I would say I can't do that. I have to pray with that person. I have to share what the Word of God says to that person. I can't lie to that person, especially if they're about to go mutilate themselves permanently because no man of God actually said, you are who God created you to be. Do you know what I mean? So I can't, I respectfully disagree. 
And so that's what they have to choose. Right now, I'm not in it, so I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying that that's what they have to choose. And uh, we're living in interesting times. Okay, in uh, Genesis chapter 16, verse 3 to 10, is the story of a woman called Hagar. Okay, I'm going to read you seven verses. So it's, just listen out to this. So after Abraham, 16, 3 to 10. Genesis 16, 3 to 10. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Underline that bit. Hagar notices she's pregnant with Abram's kid. She starts to despise her authority. All right? Don't know what that looks like. Maybe she started talking bad. Maybe he didn't listen. Maybe she, she did the wrong thing. Okay. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she shows, she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. Here is a great argument for why we should only have one wife and one husband. All right. Abram was a great man of faith, but boy, was he a dummy. All right. He was a dummy when it came to marriage. He was a dummy. Don't ever think that just because the Bible puts the stories in there that God is endorsing multiple marriages. The fact that you see this conflict arising from this situation is the Lord saying you could have had peace in your household. Now you've opened this up and you've got conflict in your household. All right. I put my slave in your arms. Now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord. She uses the Lord. I love that. May the Lord judge between you and me. I mean, she's the one that did the mistake. Abraham's the one that did the mistake, but they blame it on God. All right. Uh, your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarai mistreats Hagar. So now we've got the boss mistreating the person. So Hagar fled from her. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She says, I'm running away from my mistress. Then the angel of the Lord told her, look at this, go back to your mistreating mistress. He doesn't say mistreating. I added that in. But that's what we said in the story before. She mistreated her. There's no doubt that Sarai mistreated Hagar. What does the Lord do? The Lord doesn't say, oh, you poor baby. You have been mistreated. Yeah, we know you've been mistreated. But the Lord says, go back. Go back. And here's what he goes on to say. Um, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. This scripture is no longer culturally accepted. In today's age of time, if somebody's unkind to you, someone's mistreated you, run. Leave that church, leave that spouse, leave that person, leave that job. You deserve better. You are entitled to more. You should move from church to church, house to house, partner to partner, employment place to employment place. Now, this may sound like I'm endorsing abuse. I'm not. There's only a few cases where I would say you should not put up with mistreatment in the area of sexual abuse, physical abuse. There is no acceptance because God cares for you. He loves you. But do you know why the angel asked Hagar to go back? Because Hagar had issues that needed to be dealt with as well. The Bible says Hagar despised her master. Hagar started getting arrogant. Hagar started going, ha, I stepped with your husband and look at this. Can't have kids, hey? Well, I can. I'm as fertile as anything, right? I'm not going to do that. I'm raising the air of the next attitude, right? And the Lord says, hey, listen, the authority I put in your life is to also bring the best out of you. It's to disciple you, get the rough edges off you, break the arrogance off you, break that wrong mentality off you and develop humility in you. If you keep running 
from authority that hurts, you will remain an immature brat. You'll remain an immature, uneducated, ungrowing, undiscipled believer. And don't we see that? Don't we? You've been in church for 30 years, but you haven't been able to be in the church for longer than three? The Lord leads me on. I just feel like the Lord is leading me on. Oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> the number of times I think it's not the Lord. It's not the Lord. But the moment you say it's the Lord, you've told me one thing. I don't want you to be my accountability. The moment you go to your pastor or your leader and you say, the Lord has told me I've got to do this, you're not asking them to be account your accountability. You're not laying it before them. Going, I'm feeling this. What do you think? No pastor's going to say, I overthrow the Lord. If you go to somebody and say, the Lord said, then guess what? I'll say, God bless you. I'm not here to argue with the Lord. Well, there's no conversation. Because how can any pastor say, well, I don't think the Lord said. Well, then if you think what the Lord said and what I think the Lord said, and therefore I'll just go with what I want anyway, right? So if you really want accountability, go back to your accountability, even when sometimes they mistreat you and serve them well. But I just love that promise. The angel says, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. He says, if you submit to authority not only will your life be blessed but your children are going to be blessed the generations after you are going to be blessed see my kids go to a christian school and like every school there's issues right and they'll come home you won't believe this teacher is the worst teacher everybody said and everybody did this and everybody said and do you know what i got a detention do you know why i got a detention dad because i put my top button what sort of school gives out a detention if you put your top button on we didn't even know who that the top button wasn't allowed to be on it's just the thing to do right i said guys do your detention with a sweet spirit Mum and dad are not going to come in galloping on their horse to rescue you. How dare you give my child a detention because he put his top button on? I said, and the next time you get a detention for the top button, you'll have to do detention at school and then you'll come and deal with mum and dad at home. But it's a stupid rule. That's not what I asked you. It's not about whether you like the rule or you like the style. That's not submitting to authority submitting to authority is going i don't like this but i'm gonna do it because you have been placed there by him and i love you and i honor you and i respect you and i trust you and you know what this painful leader that's in my life right now they're gonna get something out of me they're gonna get some rebellion out of me they're gonna get some pride out of me they're gonna get some lack of perseverance out of me so out of honor for you, I will honor you. Don't do your kids a big disfavor by rescuing them from their God-placed authority. Now, if the teacher is beating your kids, go in there, have a chat. There's, certain, there's only a few, two times that I've had to go into the school and the teachers tell me all the time, the teachers are tell us every day, there is a single, at least one parent every day complaining at least about one thing because no longer does this generation teach yeah. the next generation to submit to authority. But in three kids' lives, one is in year 12 now, from everyone started at kindy to year 12, right? I've gone twice to the school. The first time, I can't remember. The second time is the Christian school was uh, bringing in a transgender teacher to um, do studies just he's walking around with his handbag and you know da, 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 da. and i'm like i'm paying too much money <laughs> no i am i'm paying way too much money for a transgender <laughs> teacher to come and teach my kids straight away appointment with the principal i just want to know i love you guys i support you guys i've spoken well in front of other parents i've never listened there was another issue where someone brought up i brought to the school to protect you guys i've always fought for you but i cannot have a 
Christian transgender teacher teaching my kids in a Christian school because immediately it goes against the word of God and it tells my kids that you can be Christian and transgender and you can't. And then they say, oh, no, we didn't know that. You know, yeah, he has been wearing his bags on his hand. I said, and this pants that are like skirts and a blousy kind of T-shirt, shirt, you know, and, and he needs to be told how he can dress. And so they did. Because all my life, I've been encouraging my kids to submit to the leadership of the school. But now this one, I can't. So there's a time to do it. And I did it with honor. I did it privately. All the parents were gossiping about it. We stayed right out. I took it straight to the right person. Did it with honor. It got sorted out. Then everything else, kids, too bad. Did you say tuck your shirt in? Tuck your shirt in. Did you say no? They had the rule. Sides can only be one, one blade shorter or one to two blades shorter than top. So that's a five, that can be a three, that can't be a two. If that's a seven, that can't be a one. Okay, don't like it, too bad. Too bad, don't like it, too bad. That's the rules. Learn, flourish under the rules. Can I just tell you, my kids are so much better off knowing that they don't run to mum and dad to sort out their problems. They go, if we tell dad, it's probably gonna tell us to submit. So let's not tell dad. <laughs> I'm serious, right? Because dad's gonna probably tell you to go and submit to that leader. You know, if they come back and they say, oh, that youth leader doesn't like me, sometimes they do that. I think too bad, that youth leader loves you. Why don't you invite them over for dinner? I don't wanna do that. Too bad, then you're not, you're, you're not gonna get out of this. This is God-given authority. <coughs> Does this make sense? Thoughts? You're all thinking, I'm going to run around the room. Kuma. Good. I've got one question. Good. Though. Good. Uh, remember how we say it in the degree? It, it, it's, it's a concept which is heavily thought in corporate world. Yeah. Where you can't openly disagree yeah. with someone. So what's your thought on that model? I mean, Czech's leadership model and you know, this corporate leadership model, what's your thoughts on that? I think agree to disagree is an opening to that's a bit harsh uh, I think it is an opening for people to rebel in their hearts and perform on the outside so it's like I love you I love you I love you I can't stand that person because that's what it's saying, right? Let's just, let, it, it, let's just agree to disagree, i.e. we're completely on the different page, but let's just be friends. Let's just be, let's just agree. So we're never gonna work this out, right? I'm not gonna submit to you. I'm probably gonna be working against you. But it's just a nice way to say, I'm just gonna be working against you behind your back, sometimes. Sometimes that's a bit harsh. That's why I said assumption. But there's good if it's not a big issue, right? Uh, I like black. I like blue. Okay, let's agree to disagree. Which one's better? That's different. But I'm talking about where they're your leader and they're asking you to do something, and you're saying, "I'm not going to do it." Let's agree to disagree that this is the right thing, right? Instead of actually saying, "Actually, I want you to know that I disagree," right? But because it's not an ungodly thing that you're asking. I'm going to submit. And submission is kingdom. Good, good question. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yes. Oh, good one. <laughs> well, they're straight into good questions then, huh? Go for it. Husband and wife. This is a tough one. Yeah, especially uh, let's say you're a woman and you have you know, a call of God in you and everything, your husband doesn't agree, or how do you work it out? Okay, same rule. Same rule applies, right? We honor, we respect, we love. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, in a functional marriage, 
honor, respect, and love will actually open the hearts to hear each other. The goal is to hear each other. Why don't you want to go through? Maybe it's about church. I feel called to this church. I feel called to this church. Oh, you can't agree to disagree. <laughs> because that means splitting the family, splitting the children, commitments, you can't partner. So what, what's, what's the way to go? Okay, why? Well, I felt like God said this. All right. Bang, 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 bang. The Bible says in the end, okay, wives should submit to their husbands unto the Lord. But the husbands need to respect their wives, to love their wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He was willing to die, right? Now, does the wife say, you better die for me, <laughs> right? No. That was just, that's a surefire way not to get him to do that. The husband, should, should the husband say, you better submit to me, right? No, that's a sure way to end the conversation. So even though the Bible is talking about mutual sacrifice and, and to some extent mutual submission in that way, right? So the pattern is respect and love and die for your wife. Honey, are you sure? What do you think? bring it up, discuss, discuss. But if at the end, and Sharon and I, we have done this for 21 years together, all right? In the end, the Bible says, wives submit to your husband for one reason. Because in the end, if one person doesn't submit, the family is ripped apart. So communicate, use wisdom, listen to each other, respect, Pray, fast, get godly counsel, get others involved to get some help, right? But after all of that, right? If he's not willing to die for, die to himself, then he, the Lord says, wives, I'm going to ask you to sacrifice. So then she comes under and she goes, fine, I disagree, but I love you. I'm going to live according to this. God's going to bless us. I'm going to submit to the Lord and submit to you. And at least there's unity in the house. Right? But the number of times that Sharon and I have been different, and I want this, she wants that, but after talking, it's actually gone like this. I've actually submitted to, oh, that's wisdom. God's in that. Then there's other times when it's been like that. She's like, okay, that's I don't love that idea, but okay. How many kids do you want to have? I want more. She says, oh, I don't want more, right? Then I'm like, I really want more. But she's the one that has to have them. She's the one that will be stuck at home with them in the early stages. And she didn't want another one, but I really wanted one. Really wanted one, but she really didn't. And we pray. And God didn't say, don't have children or have children any more than three. Then one night, I have this dream where Sharon's pregnant and she finds that she's pregnant and she's crying. Then I find out that it was a girl. And I always thought that if she had a girl, she'd be happy, right? And in the dream, when she found out she was a girl, she cried all the more, all right? And I woke up and, whoa, what is that? And I said, babe, I had this dream. She goes, I told you, I don't want any more threes. Three is it. I love my boys. Our family's complete. Let's look at fostering or helping or being grandparents or getting other people's kids in, whatever. Three's enough, you know? And I go, but you had a girl. And she goes, oh, that would be horrible. <laughs> 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 if I was a grandmother kid, at least give me a boy. I don't want to relearn how to do everything and then relearn how to do everything for a girl. You know? I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, I so that day, made an appointment, <laughs> go see the doctor, you know? Uh, <laughs> right? But here's the deal. We prayed, we argued, we debated, we talked, we prayed, we loved each other, we kept it postponing it. God spoke. I submitted. I respected. I died to myself, right? And our family is whole. But when no one submits, when both choose to be stubborn, the whole family suffers. That's why the Lord says, please submit. Does that help? All right, Cosmo. Um, when we talk about like, having that authority, 
How how do you figure out? Yeah. How do you have those people like you're mm -hmm. looking at that list that I right found? There are uh, areas in my life that aren't being covered. So then, how would you go in and like decide to pray about it? Like, what else? Don't pray about it. Right. People say I'm praying about authority, which authority. It's just a postponement tactic. Mm -hmm. You don't need to. You already know there's some good people around you. You just have to go and do it. You just have to go and ask. So we did this before, and I said to somebody, you know, and they said, oh, I'm going to pray about it. I love this message. I'm going to pray about it. One month later, you're still praying about it. <laughs> what? Praying about what? That Jesus would mentor you himself? <laughs> Because that person's great, but they're not perfect. Yeah, I know. Awesome. Because that's going to deal with your stuff when they're not being perfect and they're imperfect and it's going to draw out all this stuff in you. And that's what God wants to deal with, you know? So find somebody. If you see that there's fruit in their life in that particular area, invite them. Now, you don't need to say, will you be my mentor? Would you disciple me? Forget all that. Just befriend and then say, hey, listen, in this area, what do you see? How can I, because I value your opinion, I trust you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes you go, will you be my accountability partner? It doesn't really work. Because a pastor's got like 50 people that they have asked them, you know, you know, so just go up to that person and say, hey, listen, in my life, I value your opinion. In this area, what do you see I need to change? That's you making them an accountable person without the formalities of you sign this paper and I sign that paper and once a week you'll call me once a week. When people say to me, can you like mentor me? I said, okay, what does that look like? Well, maybe once every two weeks you call me and I say, no, I won't. And they go, why not? It's because if I have to call everybody once every two weeks, I'm not gonna, no, no. But what I will do is when you make time to come and at church on a Sunday or somewhere and you pull me aside and you say, hey, Pastor John, what do you think about this? I will always be honest with you. I'll pray for you. But I can't do that for every man that's struggling with this and that and the other. I've got, I've got my own stuff to deal with, you know? So it doesn't need to be this formal thing, but in your heart, you're placing that person in a place where they can speak into your life. And don't wait and pray about it. Go and do it this week. Make a coffee appointment, ask them, speak into my life. Cool? Yeah. Great. Gloria. Um, so early on when you were saying that if you aren't under authority, you can't have authority. I, I um, just made me think of instances where a leader who has authority has later been found out to have some kind of people sin and then people who were under them when I've, you know, I've met them and they've got, got to a point where they've shared with me their experience of being under a leader who got happened with them and the hurt they're carrying. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I, I don't really know how to help someone who has experienced that without slamming the leader or, yeah. you know, how do you be great? Yeah. Explain why God gets question. them. Good question. And it's the same question of did God put Hitler into that place of authority? And according to scripture, the answer is yes. And we can't understand with our uh, human understanding of good and evil and right and wrong and the timing of God and why that was allowed for Herod, Nero, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, you know, all the tyrants and dictators, right? <laughs> and so all I would say is, yes, we believe that all authority, because he says everybody means all authority, all authority, all authority. Like Paul is repeating it. Paul's writing it in a time when the, the national authority were ungodly and killing Christians and persecuting Christians and doing all that sort of stuff. So he's understanding that. He's not saying in my perfect world, all authority. He's saying, no, in our world right now, when all hell is breaking loose, we must understand that that authority has been established by God. God raises kings and God just deposes them. So we go to the highest authority, 
we submit to the current authority unless they're asking us to do what our highest authority tells us no. How do we help someone that's been hurt in those situations? The natural reaction of someone who's been hurt by authority is to run away from all authority. The last thing they need is to be uncovered. So the best way you can teach them and help them is to bring them under covering. Tell them their need to be protected. The authority comes from God. I'm sorry that this happened to you. What did you learn? That leader wasn't under authority and you didn't like the fruit of their life. But if you don't deal with this, you're going to repeat that fruit in your life. And I care too much for you to do that. I'm noticing that you're becoming bitter. I'm noticing that you're closing off to authority. I've noticed that you're, you know, not being as vulnerable and as humble to te and teaching to teaching as you used to be. I'm concerned for you. And I reckon it's because of what happened here. And I really want to encourage you to get back into fellowship, get back into covering, get back into accountability, you know, and allow God to heal you. <clears throat> Pastor Dan and Faith Dean have got a powerful testimony. If you ever get a chance to sit with them, they came across um, a university, they came to a church, and the senior pastor had a uni kind of church. And I'm just trying to recall the story because <coughs> it's happened over 20 something years ago. This pastor was so controlling that he scared all of his people. They had to do this, they had to be there, they had to do this, otherwise he'd come down on He was a little Indian bloke, right? And it got to the point where this pastor was doing, getting them to do all sorts of stuff that they shouldn't be doing, you know, control. They were so in their heads. So all 14 of the uni students got so scared, they left their homes and went into a hotel and bunkered down. That's how scared they were of their senior pastor. These are uni students. I mean, Dan Ying's not a small boy, right? These guys are all millionaires and business people today. So they're all strong uni students, but this person led them to Christ da, 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 and then after that did this horrible stuff. So then one day they were so scared that the senior pastor was gonna come and find them and hurt them that they said, we can't keep hiding in the hotel anymore. They would go to work two at a time. No, seriously, we're talking like cultish control, right? This is Dan and Faith, being sweet Dan and that's, they were grown up in that. And so it got to a time where they said, you know, if he comes and hurts us and we die or something like that, no one will know why. So they then all 14 of them or whatever went to Perth Christian Life Center and sat with our pastors and told them the whole story. And this guy was an Indian guy around my age doing that now some of those guys that left have not gone under any form of authority okay two years later when i planted the church dan and faith Dean chose to come and plant and serve in center point church on a weekly basis under an indian pastor that's miraculous the very so there would be times that I would be saying stuff with mannerisms or whatever that would give them flashbacks to that controlling pastor. But they said, you know what? I'm not going to let this authority that wrecked my life, I'm not going to let that affect my future. They know all my faults. Dan and Faith have been with me now for 17 years in leadership, closely with me and Sharon. And I didn't even know the story. One day I get them up there on our 10th anniversary and they share this story. And I'm like, I don't know if I'll ever want to go back to church if I was them. Yeah. Let alone be in church, serving on a weekly basis with an Indian pastor. And the moment they gave their testimony, something supernatural happened. Within months, she found herself pregnant with twins, you know, because she couldn't conceive for that long time. And something broke and she gave that testimony of, it was actually coming back into the house that restored us. And God just did something supernatural there. And that's the power of that. You know, I, I guess I'm just saying, don't let someone's brokenness through authority stop your future. Help them get whole again. Does that help? Yeah. I hope that helps. Lauren. No, that's okay. No, I love all this though. I love um, I really like authority. I love the problem.
probably came from ten years ago, not so much. Um, I think when you were found a really good leadership, good authority, you have those experiences um, when you are faced. And I, I've had authority within the church challenge me on things that were quite personal, um, that may not even be dealt with right. But I think when you they they still are good authoritarians, you are still able to understand that you come under their authority and you hope and pray that maybe you are right in that situation that they see the error of that later. Yeah. Um, but that's not for you to worry about. Yeah. And I think that's something for a lot of planning businesses. We have to make the choice of how our response is going to be and is that going to be the consistent through the core of what we believe or yeah. are we going to allow, allow the world's position yeah. Let's face it, that changes every five years. Yes. Two years. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Is, yeah. Is humility is made. Yeah. yeah. I've been in the same church for 37 years out of my 44 years. I uh, came to Australia, we went to Bill Call Centre, which became Cannon City, which became Perth Christian Life Centre, which became Life City, which became Kingdom City, which they planted us out. So all the same church, one church, same leader, David Storer, before that was Jim McCourt, before that. I've had so many youth pastors, I've had great leaders, I've had strong leaders, I've had weak leaders, I've had bad leaders, I've had disorganised leaders, but we just determined that unless, and that's literally how we planted the church, I had a dream where God planted us out. <laughs> and I woke up very upset because I didn't want to leave my church, but I was doing that out of obedience. They were far from perfect. I have cried over leadership decisions. I have cried over the hurt of leaders. I have been hurt myself. I have been a bad leader sometimes. I have hurt other people, but there's this determination that I'm going to be planted, I'm going to keep sweet, and everything that we have seen in our life has been blessed because of that. You know, one day I got all our elders up. On, this is when we only were at one campus church, and uh, got them all up. And I said, "Okay, one honest question before the whole church. They didn't know this was happening. All of them and their spouses, all of them up on the board and up. And I said, "Okay, if I have not." disappointed you or hurt you or done something wrong to you please stay standing and everyone including my wife sat down right and so i want you to see this it's not a surprise to me that i'm human and flawed Sometimes I've known that I've done it and I've apologized. Other times I didn't know I didn't apologize. But I just want you to see this. These people, Dan and Faith and Derek and Christine, and all these guys have been here through it. They've seen my flaws. I've hurt them. Why are they still here? Because it's spiritual maturity. It's to realize that all the authority in your life are flawed. They will hurt you. They will make mistakes. You are not submitting to them for them. You're submitting to them because he has placed you under them. You know, and in the same way, you will thrive. You can easily go and start your own church, never go to church again, leave this church, but you decided to stay. And may God bless you and your children and your children's children according to that scripture. Joshua. Um, I had a question uh, about you said when you left and David Story or some pastor said when I'm not using pastor anymore, but peers and you still took it. How does that work? Like is there boundaries of like I guess uh, if he says something that's not really aligned or relevant to what like what do you do? What's the wrestle with like with authority? You are technically in, but you yeah. put in that place in authority. Brilliant question. Our time is gone, so I won't answer it. No, no. <laughs> okay, I'll say, I'll say it this way. 2008, I'm feeling this need to, for our church, Centrepoint is going to have two campuses. When campuses weren't a thing, Perth Christian Life Center never did campuses. They weren't a thing. So I go to my senior pastor and say, Pastor David, I reckon 
I, I should start a second campus because I don't think that's a good idea, John. Because you look, you're your own person, but I don't think I don't think that's good. I think that's a bad idea. I think that is completely not not right. And I was devastated. Two thousand nine yeah. again. He said, "Joel, we don't plant campuses in Harvest Net. We only plant autonomous churches." And then he even got to the point where he says, "Joel, if you want to do it." Do it. If you're feeling like you're called to obey God and do it, do it. I will never tell you to disobey God. But you can't be a part of future Harvest Net church plants because we plant independent churches. And you will not be able to plant an independent church if you're trying to look after campuses. You know, you'll always go toward the campus rather than church. I'm like, no, but I can do it. I can do it. He said, no, no, no. 2010, the church that we planted in 2008, which is now Center Point Maddington, needed change. And so we tried this person, no. We tried that person, no. David Storer turns to me and goes, maybe you should take this as a campus. And I'm like, cool, done. Took it as a campus. From that day onwards, the policy at Harvest Net changed. You can do campuses. Now Perth Christian Life Center is now Kingdom City Cannonvale, a campus church, right? So he couldn't see it then. And I had an opportunity to say, you know what? I am my own senior pastor. I've got my own board. I can do what I want. Mm -hmm. But every time I wanted to do that, and there was times very close, God would say, didn't you ask him to be your senior pastor? I'm like, yes, but he told me we're friends. <laughs> 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 Let's agree to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> right? But no, I just submitted, I submitted, I submitted. And so what happened is I got the full blessing. So if you're wanting to ask a question, you really need to hear the answer. Yeah. 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 Ye
I should know my authority. I should build the relationship. I should teach the truth. I should then I can say, hey, Josh, can you help me? Because I've served you. I love you. You trust me. I have faith in you. You have faith in me. Can you help me? But I just want to make sure, guys, this curtains are always done well, right? That's different. But if you have to use your authority to get something done, you probably don't actually have authority. Does that make sense? I think it was Margaret Thatcher that said, um, being a leader and being a woman is the same. If you have to tell somebody you are either, you're probably not good at either, <laughs> at both, right? I am a woman! Oh, okay. No, in that case, you're probably not doing really well. So she said, being a leader and being a lady is, is the same. If you have to tell somebody that you are one, then you're not doing a good job. I have to tell my husband I'm a woman. You forget I'm a woman sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. And I'm very confident. Sharon says that too. Sharon says that too. But I just see them in a female. Get time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Closing comments, Uncle George. I'm sorry, I've got oh, eight okay. minutes over. Yeah, well, the, especially about authority. I mean, you know, I, I truly, I believe in this mm. scripture. And it has helped me a lot as well. Yeah. Because I always want to do something. You know, even if I'm a guest speaker in a church, I am not that type of people. Mm. I just have my own way. Yeah. Never. So I can figure it out. Yeah. Even in another nation, I was suffering to always train my family or. That's right. I always to protect myself. That's right. And, you know, great protection. Oh, yeah. I've seen so many leaders in the ministry here. You're my own personal friends. Shipwrecks. Yes. Beautiful ministry. Yeah. And they were shipwrecks. Because no problem. Yeah. This is so important. And you need more accountability the higher you go up in leadership, not less. Don't believe the lie. Cool. Hey, it has been an honor and a privilege to do these sessions with you. Um, even though our classes are finished, if you ever have any leadership questions, anything I can help you with, anything I touched on that is stirring and doesn't sit well, want to talk it through, anything like that, I'm here. I want you to know that it's been a privilege and an honor to lead and speak. And thank you for receiving me so well. I do want to pray a blessing over you guys. Is that all right? Father, I just thank you for this amazing team of great leaders. Lord, each one anointed and called, each one, Father God, to set apart for your purposes. And Lord, I just bless them. I bless their families. And Lord, use them to extend your kingdom far and wide. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And at 1.40 p.m.